questions, meet the scientist monthly, si monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. John Mann will present Surviving Psychiatric Illness, Suicide Risk Assessment, and Prevention. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds research around the world that identifies the causes, improves treatments, and will ultimately result in preventative techniques and cures for mental illness. The Foundation has awarded more than $320 million in research grants since 1987. We are the largest funder of mental health research grants outside of the federal government. And what makes us unique is that 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in the grants given directly to researchers who are working to find scientific breakthroughs. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. John Mann. Dr. Mann is the Paul Jensen Professor of Translational Neuroscience and Psychiatry and Radiology and Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University. Dr. Mann is past president of the International Academy of Suicide Research, and prior to joining Columbia, he held faculty positions at Cornell University Medical College and the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Mann was the recipient of a NARSAD Distinguished Investigator Grant in 2008 and is a member of the Foundation's Scientific Council. The Council identifies the most promising research proposals to receive funding from the Foundation. Today's webinar will be interactive. First, we'll start with Dr. Mann's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation. As your moderator, I will present your questions to Dr. Mann and we will address as many as possible. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. John Mann. John, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a, uh, an honor to be able to participate in this uh, program um, and to, in general, support the programming and efforts of the uh, Brain and Behavior Foundation. Um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, suicide risk assessment and prevention. Now, this is an extremely important topic. Um, all over the world and, and, and no less in the United States uh, because suicide is just such a major cause of loss of life, particularly amongst young people. Um, a lot of people don't appreciate that, um, that the, um, a worldwide there's thought to be somewhere between 800,000 and a million suicides per year, every year. And uh, that number is um, substantially higher than the number of individuals who are thought to die by um, in wars throughout the world. So um, if we, uh, the next slide shows you uh, my disclosures. Um, and the most relevant thing here is that um, at Columbia we developed the um, classification system that the Food and Drug Administration and the uh, centers for Disease Control and a lot of other places use for suicidal behavior and ideation. And we developed a clinical um, rating scale um, for the severity of suicide um, called the CSSRS. And um, um, my colleagues and, uh, and I get a, um, a royalties for the uh, u commercial use of that scale. Um, however, if you as clinicians or any researcher uses the scale, it's available free um, to any individual worldwide uh, to be used. Um, next slide, please. So the critical thing in suicide prevention for psychiatry is that psychological autopsies, which means interviewing the loved ones, the family members of individuals who died by suicide after the suicide, 
has confirmed that over 90% of suicides in the Western world have a diagnosable psychiatric illness at the time of their suicide. And most of those um, individuals die by suicide during a psychiatric illness that is untreated. So suicide overwhelmingly in the United States and other Western nations is the result of la largely untreated psychiatric illness. If you examine the lifetime mortality due to suicide in previously hospitalized patients, it's very high. 15% of all individuals who have been hospitalized with a major depressive episode as part of a major depression uh, died by suicide. Almost 20% of bipolar patients and almost 20% of alcoholics, 10 to 15% of schizophrenics, and, 10, and about 10% of people with um, uh, borderline and antisocial personality disorders. And when you have combinations of psychiatric illness, and we know that, for example, um, alcoholism is quite common comorbidly with um, major depression or with bipolar disorder, and other types of substance use disorders are quite common in bipolar disorder. Um, borderline personality disorder is um, uh, a common comorbid feature of uh, major depression. Um, these combinations of illnesses carry even higher risk than the illness alone. And now in the next slide, we have taken this information along with the observation that although it's almost obligatory to have a psychiatric illness in order to make, die by suicide, most individuals with a psychiatric illness never attempt suicide. And this means that having the psychiatric illness may be necessary for nearly all suicides, but it's not sufficient. The individuals who are at highest risk have something else that makes them vulnerable to suicidal behavior in the context of a psychiatric illness. That's something else we call a vulnerability or diathesis, predisposition for suicidal behavior. It's not the same thing as the psychiatric illness, it's something else, and it's, we're going to talk a bit about the something else. This explains why some individuals with a psychiatric illness never make a suicide attempt, whereas others are vulnerable to suicide attempts. The components that have been identified are shown in this slide that's in front of you right now. First of all, individuals with, say, a mood disorder, which accounts for 60% of the diagnoses in suicides, um, that make suicide attempts or die by suicide, are different from the ones that never make a suicide attempt by having much more pronounced impulsive or aggressive traits. We now term this um, reactive aggression. This is a, reflects a more general tendency to act on powerful feelings. So we have angry feelings a lot more than we have suicidal feelings, even those people who suffer from depression. So there's angry behavior more frequently manifested than suicidal behavior. So one way of sort of assessing this um, propensity to act on feelings is to ask about aggressive behaviors. But of course, um, we also ask about suicidal behavior. <clears throat> the second area where people are different when they, in terms of being at higher risk for suicidal behavior should they become depressed or psychiatrically ill, is in terms of what we call pessimism. And we have identified pessimism because these individuals have more sub severe subjective depression. If you do a Hamilton rating scale or a Madras or one of the clinician um, assessed instruments um, for determining the severity of depression, for example, 
there's no difference between people who make suicide attempts and people who don't make suicide attempts um, but are suffering from this, a psychiatric illness like major depression or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. However, if you give these individuals a subjective rating scale, a rating scale that they fill in and tell you how distressed they feel, they score more highly if they are suicide attempters compared to non-attempters. And in fact, so their subjective depression is worse, they report more hopelessness, they recall fewer reasons for living, and they have more severe suicidal thoughts. So that's the a difference between people having a psychiatric illness who make suicide attempts and people who never make a suicide attempt despite having um, the same duration and the same number of depressive episodes and the same severity, clinical severity of depressive episodes. Another difference is that the depression starts earlier in the individuals at risk for suicidal behavior and that's also coupled with more impulsive aggressive traits. People with more impulsive aggressive traits have an earlier onset of depression um, in their lives. We're not sure why. And finally, there's a very interesting difference in the domain of um, cognitive um, regulation um, that affects things like problem solving, um, reappraisal, uh, thinking out of the box, um, etc. They seem to be more cognitively rigid and less able to solve problems, and that probably is um, one of the ways the patient describes this um, that you've often probably heard them talk about their suicide attempt if they've survived, that they use terms like, I felt trapped, I couldn't think of another solution or another way out, I felt stuck, um, and so on. All of these are uh, colloquial terms for describing these kinds of cognitive um, difficulties that one can measure in the laboratory. So this constellation combines together to uh, make people, uh, put people at risk. So just summarizing that, this is the stress diathesis model or stress predisposition model, and the stressor is the acute psychiatric illness such as a major depressive episode or a psychosocial crisis, usually both. Um, the psychosocial crisis is like the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's the thing that happens immediately before an attempt very often, but it's not the thing that caused the attempt. The thing that caused the attempt was an untreated depression combined with this predisposition. Now the best clue, the best clinical clue to the presence of the predisposition is a personal or family history of a suicide attempt. And that's why we emphasize in screening for risk, asking about a previous suicide attempt in the person, in the patient you're seeing or in has there been such a suicide attempt in the family. The suicide attempt could be um, in the family could be um, fatal or non-fatal. Um, this is not a perfect screening tool since two-thirds of all suicides die at the first attempt, but it is the most um, powerful screening tool for suicide risk. Next slide. We show you a pictorial model of this um, suicidal behavior. On the left-hand side, you see the stressor, which could be an acute psychiatric illness combined with a psychosocial crisis. That leads to suicidal ideation. The diathesis or predisposition has these different components that we've talked about, the hopelessness or pessimism, the impulsiveness or reactive uh, behavior, and, um, and there are neurotransmitters that are identified with each of these two. Um, what was not, what's not shown on this is a third component, um, the um, uh, cognitive component. And the cognitive component is affected by these neurotransmitters as well as by these traits. But there's also a potential role for other um, um, factors in the brain, including cortisol, which is part of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis. It's a stress response system. And those of you who have ever been treated with steroids, um, such as prednisone or hydrocortisone, know that your ability to think and um, work cognitively is often affected quite strikingly when you take these steroids. And the people who are vulnerable to, to suicidal behavior 
they are often people who have an overactivity of the HPA axis. So when they're stressed, such as during a depression, especially if it's not treated, they excrete excessive amounts of cortisol which flood the brain and impair not only mood control but also cognitive function. And these three elements, the pessimism, the impulsive reactive behavior and the cognition um, combine together to process the suicidal ideation and determine the risk for a suicidal act. Now in the next slide, there's a summary of how one can try and prevent suicidal behavior. This summary comes from an article in JAMA 2005 um, on suicide prevention strategies. Um, for those of you who are interested, you can um, um, I encourage you to take a look at this article. This is the most highly cited article in psychiatry on the subject of suicide prevention, um, as far as I'm aware. Now, in the pale blue on the right are prevention strategies. On the left are all those elements, uh, many of the elements that I've already mentioned that places people at risk. So you see the stressful life event and you see the mood or other psychiatric disorder that produces the, side, um, the suicidal ideation and then you see the components that may contribute to risk including things like the impulsiveness, the hopelessness or pessimism and other things that um, you have probably heard of as clinicians that are important like access to lethal means. Um, in the United States, overwhelmingly, that means access to guns. And then there's the effect of imitation um, that's particularly important for young people when famous celebrities, for example, um, die by suicide, there's often a spike in the same kind of suicide in young people who tend to be more influenced by um, these kinds of media reports than older people. What about prevention? You can see here the elements that, we've, that evidence indicates actually does something for prevention. The most important element is the first one, education and awareness programs that target in particular primary care physicians, and we'll come back to that. And then there are methods for screening individuals at high risk, and we've already talked a little bit about that. That's mostly screening people for a personal family history of suicidal behavior and the, current, and the history of suicidal ideation. <clears throat> and then what do you do if you find somebody at risk? You've got a few choices. The most common choice that people have to um, is uh, pharmacotherapy, antidepressants. That's because that's something that most caregivers are able to provide. Specialized psychotherapies such as cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavior therapy um, or alcohol abstinence programs are only available in people from people or from groups that have been where individuals have been trained. And the number of people that have been trained to pro offer these options are relatively few compared to the number of people that can write a prescription for an antidepressant. Follow-up is very important. Um, even if that follow-up is just a phone call or a card, just like you get from your dentist. Um, restriction of access to lethal means makes a difference, especially when those means are widely available, like, for example, guns. Um, but there are other examples as well. Um, and media reporting does make a difference in circ special circumstances. Next slide, please. So just a reminder, who dies by suicide? In Western countries, 90% or more occur during a psychiatric illness. 60% of the people with a psychiatric illness, it, it's a mood disorder. And, only, and based on older studies, only about 13% that's right, one, three, 13 percent are adequately treated. Now, a few more recent studies, um, particularly in uh, Sweden, suggest that now more depressions are being treated prior to suicide, but the bottom line is 
the overwhelming majority are not treated prior to suicide. So that essentially we could do a lot better with suicide prevention if all we did was train people to diagnose and treat depression more effectively. If we didn't mention the word suicide, but we just had an impact on it, how many times people are diagnosed and treated with depression, we'd already have a significant effect on the treatment suicide rate in the United States. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned primary care physicians quite a bit, and I suspect that most of the people um, that have um, logged on to this webinar are not primary care physicians. Um, that just tells us what our problem is and challenge in suicide prevention. But in developed nations like the United States, GPs treat most adult depression. And in developing nations, often it's just a health work care worker. Um, but um, you can train health care workers to do a pretty good job. There's a pretty high level of contact with a primary care physician prior to a suicide. Depending on the study, up to 83% within 12 months and up to 66% within a month of death. Some studies have found lower numbers. But the bottom line here is that in most studies that have looked at this question, the rate of contact of a suicide within 30 days or within a year of the suicide is twice as high with a primary care physician as it is with a um, somebody who provides mental health care, a psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, etc. So even though the problem is undoubtedly a psychiatric illness, a lot of people, twice as many people, choose to go and see their primary care physician and probably very often frame their psychiatric illness using physical metaphors um, and that tends to guide the consultation down the pathway of checking these individuals out for some kind of occult tumor or other cause of physical illness like tiredness, um, lack of motivation, appetite loss, and weight loss, which are features of depression, as we all know, but can also be features of colon cancer and a lot of other things and very often may lead to a bunch of medical tests and the patient being told by the doctor, well, good news, um, all the tests are negative, but nobody brings up the subject of, are you feeling depressed? So the patient doesn't get diagnosed and gets sent away feeling just as disabled and miserable and hopeless, but it's never diagnosed. So that's why um, prevention involves not only doing a better job of screening for depression and treating it if you're a, um, in the field of um, mental health care, but it also means reaching out to our non-psychiatry colleagues. Uh, next slide, please. So we focus on the, um, these um, key elements that I've mentioned, and I'm going to drill down and go into those in a, a bit more detail. Um, uh, first of all, there's improved um, awareness and education for the public, the doctors, gatekeepers of all kinds, in terms of the role of psychiatric illness and treatment in preventing suicide. We need to improve our chain of care. What is chain of care? Chain of care is the connection, the connections between the people who screen and detect somebody at risk and the people who provide the definitive evaluation and treatment. And not only that, the follow-up treatment, which is all very important for prevention to work. We need to um, make available to the people that need it, especially the people who are at higher risk, um, the medications and psychotherapies for the um, psychiatric illnesses, especially major depression. We need to reduce the availability of the commonest methods for suicide, which mean guns and pills that are dangerous on overdose. Um, and we need to help the media um, develop more constructive ways of reporting suicide. Next slide. So the paradynamic uh, um, of, um, uh, illustration of the fact that we actually have the tools and the proof of what to do to reduce suicide rates um, now comes from a study in Germany. 
where um, it's called the Nuremberg Alliance Against Depression. Those of you who are older remember that Nuremberg is associated with the trials of the Nazis um, that murdered a lot of people in World War II. But Nuremberg um, is also the site of this important suicide prevention study. <clears throat> and um, they did a lot of things in this prevention study at a city-wide level. They um, worked with GPs, giving them advanced training in the diagnosis of depression and the um, treatment of depression. They had public relations information for the broader public. This was mostly focused on depression. Um, and um, they worked with gatekeepers like priests, teachers, the police, and, and the media. Um, they offered help for patients and their relatives self-help groups, high-risk groups, etc. And the goal was to optimize care for depressed patients. So, and through that, they uh, hope to impact the risk of suicidal behavior. Next slide, please. They took as their outcome measures to see how good they were going to be at, um, uh, at doing this, actual suicides and suicide attempts. So um, this was not an effort to reduce suicidal ideation or some proxy measure of risk. This was actually reducing suicide attempts, fatal and non-fatal. Next. Another aspect of this um, is that they had a control city where they didn't do this. They had just general educational health, um, psychiatry health education kinds of programs. And that was in the city of Würzburg. So they compared Nuremberg to Würzburg. And um, look at the difference. From 2001 to 2003, this program ran. And in the city of Nuremberg, there was a steady decline in suicide and suicide attempt rates. So much so that the suicidal acts declined by 32% in Nuremberg, whereas in Würzburg, there was not much of a change. They went, the rates went up and down. Um, and by the time of the last year, they had gone down by 5%. Very different. So you can see a consistent progressive beneficial effect over a period of um, three years of doing this in um, Nuremberg and not much of an effect in Würzburg. They had 183 suicides in 2000 in Würzburg and that's 173 suicides in 2003. So this clearly works. And you can do it at a city-wide level. Um, next slide, please. Not only did they manage to knock down the suicide attempt rate, but if you look at the lethality of the suicidal behavior that they affected, their prevention efforts disproportionately affected the most serious types of suicidal behavior, the most lethal attempts. Um, and you can see they've had a 53% decline in the most lethal attempts and a 15% decline in the low lethal attempts. So this program not only worked, but it worked best for the most seriously at risk patients. Next slide. So let's just run over the principles of management of the suicidal patient, because this is something that each of us as a clinician can do. We should evaluate the um, suicide risk and psychiatric diagnosis. And then we, we should treat the psychiatric disorder. We should um, make efforts to resolve or improve the psychosocial crisis, which often brings the patient um, in for evaluation. And then we should think about ways of elevating the threshold for suicidal behavior by methods of um, treatment that have already been shown to reduce the risk of suicidal behavior independent of their effects on the primary psychiatric diagnosis, of which depression is the commonest. So what actually reduces the risk of suicidal behavior over and above any effect on, say, depression? Well, there are at least three or four treatments that have been shown to do that. The first one is lithium. Lithium, interestingly enough, reduces the risk of suicide and suicide attempts in people with major depressive disorder or unipolar depression and people with bipolar disorder, independent of how well it works in preventing 
these um, mood disorders from recurring. The second drug that does some good is clozapine, which does exactly the same kind of thing for schizophrenia, for psychotic disorders. So these two drugs need to be considered for anybody with either a mood disorder in the case of lithium or schizophrenia in the case of clozapine, if that person has a history or a family history of suicidal behavior. Or describe suicidal behavior of sufficient severity to report a specific plan or method and a sense um, they may act on that, which is called suicidal intent. Uh, now, in terms of other interventions, two psychotherapies seem to reduce the risk of suicidal behavior. The first one is cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, and the second is dialectical behavior therapy. Dialectical behavior therapy has been shown to be helpful for borderline personality disorder, independent of effect on mood, and cognitive therapy has been shown to be useful in um, particularly mood disorders, but also certain types of personality disorders and maybe even in um, alcohol, people with comorbid alcoholism. And remember, cognitive therapy is interesting because it changes co mood-related cognitions, um, which may be abnormal or disproportionately abnormal in people at risk for suicidal behavior. Now, in addition to um, uh, these you know, the kind of treatments that we've talked about, the treatment of the psychiatric disorder is particularly interesting. Robert Gibbons and I published a paper um, not so long ago where we showed that the efficacy of certain medications like venlafaxine and fluoxetine in terms of reducing the risk for suicidal behavior and ideation is particularly related to the degree to which the depression is reduced in severity. So how well you treat the depression also is probably related to the degree of reduction of suicide risk in adults. That means that not, we're not only aiming to get the depression better, we're aiming to get it as much improved as we can. Um, a lot of GPs and unfortunately probably too many people in, um, in, in the mental health um, care world um, ask the patient when they come back, you know, is your depression um, better? And they say, the patient says yes, and they say, terrific, here's a prescription, go on taking the medication. They don't ask the patient, how much better is your depression? We need to focus on how much better. We need to use instruments and um, methods of, you know, proportional improvement in depression. Are you, you know, 50% of normal? 80% of normal, 20% of normal, and write those numbers in the patient's chart because the proportion to which the patient improves is directly related in adults to um, the degree of reduction in risk for suicidal ideation and behavior. So um, it's a very important thing to do. Just as internists and GPs use the sphygmomanometer to measure how much the blood pressure has gone down when they treat hypertension, we need to measure how much the person's mood has improved when we treat depression. Now, two other points here in this slide um, that I want to mention. The first is you need to calibrate the observation of the patient during the acute suicide risk period according to how much risk there is. And that's where we recommend the use of systematic questioning, maybe one, a rating scale. I've already mentioned to you the CSSRS. Um, I want to remind you I make a small amount of money from that rating scale. Um, um, each time it's used by uh, people in the pharmaceutical industry, but not when you use it. Um, I encourage you to use some kind of rating scale to measure uh, suicidal ideation um, and suicidal behavior because that will help you quantify it. And that makes sure you ask all the questions about ideation, about a plan, about intent. Um, because if they have ideation with a plan and intent, that's a psychiatric emergency. That person needs to be considered um, carefully in terms of whether they require admission to hospital. Um, and finally, if they go home, you want to make sure that they don't have the means for re readily available for suicide at home. That means no guns or gun ammunition in the house. Um, we don't accept um, the adequacy of the gun um, uh, closet. Uh, 
or um, locking up the ammunition. People have spare keys. People break into these closets. Uh, guns should be removed from the house. All pills should be removed, um, kept under um, you know, supervision of somebody else. Um, the patient should be given their medication um, until they are judged to be completely safe. Next slide, please. Now, the best um, indicator of short-term risk that we have of suicidal risk is um, suicidal ideation. And I mentioned a plan or um, intent and or intent. Um, and the thing about the ideation is that it fluctuates. We find that the patients that are the riskiest, they have a sort of a sawtooth um, pattern to the severity of suicidal ideation. They feel fine, none one day, bad the next day. Um, pretty much the suicidal ideation that they have in the week or two prior to um, seeing you is the best guide, the worst example of suicidal ideation in the week or two before they see you is the best guide to their immediate risk. It's always a problem with managed care because when they get admitted to hospital, they often want to go home and sometimes they really improve temporarily or they um, don't tell you about the suicidal ideation anymore because they want to go home. Um, your job is to ask the questions and write the answers and use your best judgment. But one day free from suicidal ideation does not mean that the patient's safe to go home or cured. You want a couple of days in a row and you want to see some improvement <clears throat> in their general psychiatric conditions such as their depression. Look for consistent improvement. Don't look for uh, one day at a time. Um, next slide. I'm going to end what I've got to talk to you about <clears throat> with a little bit about neurobiology. Because everything that you ask about, there's a, something in the brain that um, fits with that and underlies it. Next slide. <clears throat> so these kinds of components, the noradrenaline, the serotonin, the HPA axis, um, all of these things can be measured. And they are important as part of the predisposition to suicidal behavior. Next slide. So, for example, the serotonin system, which many of us were taught is related to depression, is also intimately related to this decision-making process or how reactive the person is in terms of their emotions. Next slide. And norepinephrine um, has been known for a long time in um, animal studies to be related to the behavioral phenomena associated with hopelessness or giving up behaviors. And now we have evidence that that's even true in patients, that when you measure norepinephrine indices in the spinal fluid of patients, that you can predict the lethality and the probability of a future suicide attempt by how deficient their norepinephrine system is um, when they come and present in hospital. Next slide. I mentioned the HPA axis, cortisol, the stress response system, that it seems to be hyperactive. People with a hyperactive um, HPA axis system have a four and a half times greater chance of dying by suicide if they, when they present with depression. So that's a four and a half times greater chance of dying by suicide. If we had a measure like that for a chance of dying of a heart attack, everybody would be having this measure. And remember, cortisol affects mood control, stability of mood control, and cognition. So it affects the risk in two different ways. Next slide. <clears throat> Brain imaging is really interesting because it's allowed us to map where things have gone wrong in the brain of people at risk for suicidal behavior. Next slide. We can actually map the brain in terms of the serotonin system first, and even um, by using indices of serotonin deficiency. Next slide. This is what the brain looks like post-mortem. 
cut in a cut across. So this is the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain involved in mood regulation and the part of the brain involved in decision making and impulse control. It's been um, the colors represent the numbers of serotonin transporter molecules. The serotonin transporter, of course, is the target of SSRIs. And the more transporters you've got, the better the serotonin system. And the fewer transporters you've got, the less serotonin you've got um, being released in parts of the brain. Now, the red part on the inside of the slide is the anterior cingulate which is the part of the brain that's involved in decision making. It balances the choices that people are faced with. And when you're suicidal, you're choosing between the pain of depression and the option the doctor is giving you, which is take these um, medica antidepressant medications and in six to eight weeks you might feel a lot better. And the patient balances these two choices sometimes many times a day and tries to decide, am I going to hang in there and stick with the treatment or do I feel so hopeless about the treatment working and getting better and the pain is so bad that I, I just feel I can't go on and I'm going to make a suicide attempt. So the anterior cingulate is balancing those choices. The bottom of the brain, um, which is above the eyes, called the orbital prefrontal cortex, um, has an intermediate number of serotonin transporters and that's um, involved more in the decisiveness of the decision making. Next slide, please. We first looked at these measures in suicides and we found that the depression is associated with a widespread deficiency of serotonin function reflecting the many different types of symptoms that comprise the major depressive disorder um, that people have. But in terms of the abnormalities that affect people in terms of how they die, is it by suicide or some other cause, the people who die by suicide have a deficiency in the anterior cingulate and in the orbital prefrontal cortex. The two areas involved in decision making and willed action or um, impulse control. Lacking serotonin put into those areas is the diathesis or the predisposition for suicidal behavior. Um, lacking serotonin in all those other brain regions is associated with the, with the psychiatric illness that produces the suicidal thoughts in the first place. When you have the combination of the two, one superimposed on the other, biologically, you've got the people who are depressed combined with the predisposition to acting on those thoughts. It looks like we might have lost um, audio. Allow me to back into silent again. Okay. Hello, I'm back. Uh, oh, excellent. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, I, um, I'm so used to pressing a button to advance the slides, I press the button to turn off the phone. Um, next slide, please. So with a, instruments like a PET scanner, we can actually look at for the very same things that we see in people who die by suicide. Next. And sure enough, when we image these people for the serotonin transporter, we find exactly what we find in people who, or not exactly, but pretty much the same sort of thing that we find in people who die by suicide. On the left, 
you have the serotonin transporter in healthy people. Red means more transporter, yellow means intermediate, green means less, and blue means very little. This is the brain stem where all the serotonin neurons are located, plus some other parts of the brain. Um, in the middle panel, you see depressed patients, and it looks like there's a little bit less transporter binding, a serotonin deficiency, compared to the people who are healthy. On the right, you see depressed patients who have survived the suicide attempt. They clearly have a lot more deficiency than just depressed patients. So they show the presence of both depression and the predisposition of su for suicidal behavior. There's double abnormality in the serotonin system. So this actually exists in living patients. Next slide. The future. The future is all about better prediction of risk and using that, those methods for better prediction by, um, to treat more people with psychiatric illness, particularly the ones who are at highest risk. And we also want to develop better medications and psychotherapeutic interventions to reduce these pre this predisposition, predisposition to suicidal behavior, which we can assess in patients clinically by asking about past suicidal behavior or family history of suicidal behavior or by asking about the severity of suicidal ideation and maybe one day by doing a, a brain scan. Um, and remember, the reason um, the, um, we ask about the family history of suicidal behavior is that there is a family familial transmission of this risk. It's partly genetically determined partly determined by um, childhood experiences. This is the predisposition I'm talking about. And therefore, it's the, it runs in families. And that's why we ask about families. So when, you, when you're seeing your patient, just remember that um, if they've got a relative who died, who's died by suicide, they may have inherited the same predisposition to suicidal behavior as that relative had. Um, and if you have a, rel a patient and they have children um, and those children develop a psychiatric illness, they're at greater risk for suicidal behavior than if your patient has never made a suicide attempt. So these, um, these um, uh, uh, families are a way of focusing in on high-risk patients um, and identifying clusters of them. And, um, and that's uh, the end of my presentation and um, welcome any questions. Thank you, John, for an outstanding presentation on such a, an important topic. Um, we have a, a number of people who are asking about um, the issue of um, the antidepressants and the risk for suicide. And I'd like you to say a little bit about um, the FDA warning and those uh, potential risks with regard to the medicine versus the risks of, of not um, taking medicine. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yes, so that's a, that is an important question. Um, I want to say that um, um, I'm not a paid consultant for any pharmaceutical company, and I'm not on any speakers' bureaus. Um, so I think I can um, address this subject with a degree of impartiality. Um, I've been involved in a number of studies myself, and, uh, but also looking at the literature. And following the initial um, um, assessments um, by the FDA in 2004 and 2006, there have been quite a few other studies that have been performed. And broadly speaking, those studies have tended to find with larger databases or different types of databases that the risk of suicidal behavior on medications was probably overestimated in the, in the original FDA analyses. Not only that, the degree of efficacy of these medications was also probably, was probably underestimated. This is particularly true of the pediatric data. Um, so Robert Gibbons and I, uh, in a paper uh, where we reviewed every published and unpublished study that had been produced for venlafaxine, um, um, and uh, for fluoxetine in both adults and children. Um, we found that, um, and we analyzed the data on a per-person uh, 
level, not on a per study level. That's different to the FDA methodology. The per person level is much more statistically powerful and more and less likely to come up with um, a um, um, spurious finding. Uh, we found that um, there's indeed evidence at all ages um, um, of antidepressant efficacy, not just in adults or older people. Um, and that in adults, it was mostly mediated by the effect on depression, but in children, or young adults, there were um, there seemed to be other factors involved as well um, in terms of the um, uh, suicide uh, reduction risk. Uh, so, it, um, and then there have been studies looking at um, the impact of the black box warning. Um, most of those studies have suggested that the diagnosis of depression became less common after the black box warning, particularly in young people. Um, suicide rates did not decline, but prescription rates did decline. Um, and um, in fact, suicide rates, if anything, went up. Um, and the de decline in suicide rates that have been going on for a long time in young people um, stopped. Uh, and, um, and the, and the um, levels of suicide have never returned to the same trajectories. Um, that were occurred um, that were up to the um, time of uh, the 2004 introduction of the black box warning. Um, it's been shown that alternative types of treatment did not substitute for um, the use of antidepressants, so that just meant that more kids went untreated. In contrast, it was interesting to see that in older people where there was no black box warning, warning the suicide rates did continue to decline um, and prescription rates did continue to climb. So, um, by and large, it's uh, hard to see that um, um, we don't see the risk um, uh, being confirmed um, as feared, and in fact, we do see that there may have actually been um, an unwanted um, 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 negative effect of uh, reducing prescription rates in young people um, with antidepressants. The bottom line is um, clinicians should treat depression where they see it um, and they should monitor their patients carefully. And I think that's an important bottom line, not only for clinicians, but many of the people listening to today are family members or people themselves that may have depression. Um, and the important thing is to seek help to get treatment um, and to make sure that uh, the person is monitored closely by their treating professional. Um, a, a, another issue that uh, has um, come up is the issue of um, screening for uh, depression or other psychiatric conditions, in particular in schools. Um, and I'm curious what your take is on that issue. There's good evidence that screening programs work. Um, using um, and people can be trained um, gatekeepers such as um, school teachers, um, school psychologists, obviously pretty well trained already, but um, uh, people first responders, <coughs> uh, people in the military, clergy can be trained to screen people um, and um, screening instruments, can have been um, um, that address both ideation and suicidal behavior are the best for that purpose. Um, and um, but uh, and the reason that screening works is it does identify um, people that were not previously recognized as being at risk. Um, and um, so that's an, that's um, an important um, accomplishment. However, the, these screening programs are not useful unless they are coupled in a um, well-organized fashion with um, uh, professional evaluation and treatment. So you can use a screening program, particularly say in schools, to determine who seems to be really at risk. For example, who has ideation with plan and intent. And those kids need to go off and be immediately evaluated by a um, a mental health professional in the emergency room, um, in a, um, community, a mental health community center, clinic, somewhere. They need prompt evaluation. Uh, the ones that don't have ideation to that level of degree 
can have an appointment made and there's not quite the same level of urgency. Um, but um, the screening program has to be coupled to something like that. On campus, um, if you have um, web-based screening, which um, often exists in, in more and more campuses, in colleges, for example, um, those um, um, screening services need to be coupled to the offer for help through um, student health services and things like that. So we, you know, I recommend that approach, but only when it's coupled with um, with professional evaluation and uh, um, treatment services. Good, thank you. Um, and the uh, one of the areas of uh, great interest is um, the use of or the potential use of rapid acting antidepressants, with ketamine being a model of that. Um, and, and a good amount of research is being done along those lines. I'm curious what uh, your experience um, and perspective is about uh, ketamine uh, and also you know, the potential for uh, other rapid-acting antidepressants and how that relates to suicide. Um, I think that uh, ketamine is still in a relatively early stage of evaluation. There's a lot of promising um, uh, data from small uh, controlled clinical trials. Um, we are conducting one of the first, maybe we started it, the first um, dose finding study with ketamine. Um, that's important. It's funded by the NIMH. We also have a study of ketamine in people who are on treatment or not on treatment for depression, um, MDD or bipolar depression, who have suicidal thoughts or have made a suicide attempt, have a family history of a suicide attempt, in other words, higher risk suicidal patients. These studies are important because ketamine appears to not only work extremely rapidly in a few hours, but it also, when it works, it gets people a lot better, not just a little better. So in those two ways, it's different to current antidepressants. It works much faster, and when it works, it works much better. Um, it also seems to have a very profound effect on suicidal ideation in terms of helping it, improving it. And um, in a way, that's a kind of ideal antidepressant because it makes the patient safe quickly. This is um, something that's still being evaluated in controlled clinical trials, so it's a bit premature to rush out and make this the um, recommended um, go-to treatment. But it gives you a window into the near future as to the kinds of treatment that we want to be offer offering, a treatment that works extremely rapidly and extremely well and if it doesn't work, you know right away. Um, so um, I'm, I'm pretty, um, I'm enthusiastic about the um, scientific, the worthwhile sci uh, um, the, uh, um, uh, goal of evaluating ketamine more fully and developing ketamine alternatives or ketamine-like medications uh, going forward. Um, thank you. Excellent overview about that interesting topic. Um, and uh, I just want to say, um, as we conclude today's webinar, John, um, thank you for the work that you've been doing and continue to do on this very, very important topic. Um, and thank you for uh, presenting this information today in a way that I think is very accessible um, to uh, lay people. I very, very much appreciate all that you're doing. I also want to thank um, everybody who's joined us today um, for the webinar. Um, our foundation, through its research grants, is dedicated to improving the lives of people with a wide variety of psychiatric conditions. Um, and I thank you all for joining us in that mission. All of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a donation, please visit bbrfoundation.org or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family or friend, please visit the webinar page at our website. I want to take a moment to wish everyone a very happy and healthy holiday season and a happy and a healthy new year as well. And I hope you'll join us again um, next year, um, beginning in 
January, on January 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, when we'll have a webinar entitled Updates on the Science Behind PTSD. This will be presented by Dr. Kerry Ressler. Thank you all again, and happy holidays. Take care.